How can you be so positive when everything else seems to be so grim? It's because everyone else is wrong and uh, facts are on the side of the optimist. And what we're watching right now is a regime change in global liquidity. They are going to bring interest rates down over the next 12 to 18 months. And that is going to serve as a tailwind for all investable assets. Lately, we saw in the press a lot of negative news around uh, global war, uh, imminent apocalypse. Uh, surprisingly, uh, you in this tweet said that we live uh, in the safest and uh, most prosperous times ever. And you were commenting specifically on the performance of the S&P 500. How can you be so positive when everything else seems to be so grim? It's because everyone else is wrong and uh, facts are on the side of the optimist. Uh, it's easy to look at the news or uh, kind of certain aspects of society and say, look at how bad everything is. But overwhelmingly, the data shows that we live in the safest, most prosperous time in human history. It's a fact. It's objective. And anyone who disagrees with that is on the wrong side of history. Why do you think the S&P 500 is so significant in that respect? Well, it's the 500 largest companies. And uh, that specific chart is showing uh, that the S&P 500 is outperforming uh, the 20th century, right? The 20, like we, we are doing better than we had done before. And during the 20th century, people said, we live in the safest, most prosperous time in human history. Now in the 21st century, we say it's even better than it was. And so the S&P is just one of thousands of data points that you could point to, but it's a pretty good data point. It shows what is the value creation, right? And I think a lot of it is derived back to capitalism and democracy is the best system that's ever been created. Maybe one day somebody creates a better system, but for right now, this is the best one. And so the United States ends up showing that this experiment that we're running in a democratic society and a capitalistic society is the best ever created. I want you to comment on what's going to happen very soon in the United States, which is, of course, the, uh, the upcoming U.S. elections. There are very bullish uh, predictions regarding a potential Trump victory. Analysts were saying that in case of a Trump win, we may see Bitcoin skyrocketing uh, up to 90K by the end of the year, while if we see uh, on the contrary, a Harris victory, we could see Bitcoin uh, tumble down to 30, 40,000 uh, uh, by the end of the year. So a very stark contrast here. Uh, what is your take on, on this specifically? Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are going to be successful regardless of who the president is. If you go back and you look over the last 15 years, we've had Republicans and we've had Democrats. We've had people who were sympathetic and we've had people who were abrasive to the asset class and to the assets and to the investors. Look at how far we've come multi-trillion dollar market cap and only continued adoption. And so, yes, of course, we would like to have politicians that were sympathetic, that were supportive, that were trying to help this stuff be created within the United States and also be successful globally. But it is going to be successful regardless of whether they are supportive or not. That is the beauty of these assets and of this technology. And so regardless of who wins in November, I do think that you are going to see prices continue to go up. You know, one of the things that I always point to is over the last 50 years, if you look at the stock market, it has gone up under every single president except for one. That one was George W. Bush. And it's because right as he was leaving office, he got hit with the global financial crisis. But every single president, both Republican and Democrat, has overseen a up market in the stocks. Why is that? It's because we devalue the dollar. And so Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies will continue to go up over the long run, regardless of who the president is. The last thing that I would say is I think it's important for the democracy that we live within for it to be a landslide. Regardless of who wins, we need a landslide victory for one of the candidates. And be, the reason is if there is a close race, then what you're going to see is both sides are going to debate whether it was real, whether it wasn't, was it rigged, was it not? If Donald Trump wins, you will hear the left say, it was rigged. They stole the election. They manipulated it. There was disinformation. There was uh, you know, foreign uh, intervention in the election, et cetera. If you see uh, Kamala Harris win, then you're going to see the right say the same thing. A landslide silences all that nonsense and gets us back to worrying about what is the best future for America rather than worried about who actually won the election. Uh, crypto prices are close, uh, quite close to their all-time highs, but they were higher back in, uh, uh, back in March then it, the, the crypto market has been trading sideways. So what do you think that at this moment, at this very point, uh, it's going to be the main catalyst uh, for the next leg up? Giovanni, I'm a simple man. I got a small brain. And all I know is that when they print money, 
There's more money sloshing around the system. Asset prices go up. And if they happen to be printing money and expanding the money supply at the same time that they're cutting interest rates and they're making money cheaper, asset prices go up even more. And what we're watching right now is a regime change in global liquidity. You have interest rate cuts in the United States. You got them going on in China and elsewhere around the world. You have the M2 money supply in the U.S. expanding and asset prices are going to benefit. And so people try to make this stuff really complex, but it's pretty simple. If they are expanding and stimulating, asset prices go up. If they are tightening and draining liquidity, asset prices go down. The word stimulus is a very important but very specific word. Their job is to stimulate the economy. They're going to make things get better. They're going to make asset prices go up. And that's the regime that we've entered. Once you change regimes, you can't flip-flop. You can't go loose one month, tight the next, loose again, tight again. You either got to be committed or not. And if there's one thing that the Fed is, is they're committed. And so we saw in, at the end of 2021, November, they started talking about, we're going to raise interest rates. And then they did from March of 22 uh, up until uh, September of this year, they kept raising interest rates and holding them at a high level. But in September of 2024, they decided that they're going to start cutting interest rates. So they're going to cut. And maybe they did 50 in September and maybe they pause or maybe they do another 25 basis points. But the trend now is down. They are going to bring interest rates down over the next 12 to 18 months. And that is going to serve as a tailwind for all investable assets. Last year, if I'm not mistaken, you sold um, all your uh, ETH holdings and uh, you bought uh, Solana instead. Can you explain what is the rationale behind this uh, investment decision? Solana is cheaper and faster. And I think people who are building stuff are going to want to operate on a platform that's cheaper and faster. And as more people begin to use that platform, the price of the asset's going to go up. And so far, that's pretty much what's happened. Uh, I think that since we originally bought, um, we have seen Solana go up about 300%, you know, tripled in price. Uh, at the same time, Ethereum is essentially flat. And I expect that trend to continue. I think Ethereum will go up in price, but I think Solana will go up more. And so, you know, people have heard me say before, uh, Bitcoin is an asset that I plan to hold and give to my grandchildren. It is something that is a store of value that I have deep conviction over the long run. Uh, I look at the smart contract platforms as a technology that there's a lot more competition, there's a lot more disruption, uh, and I don't have the same conviction over you know kind of a multi-decade hold. For me, it is more so uh, over a cycle. And so in this cycle, I think that Solana will outperform Ethereum. The beauty is if I'm right, then I'll be rewarded. If I'm wrong, I'll lose money. And so you know, let's see what happens. Last time we talked was back in spring 2020, so essentially over four years ago, basically one entire four-year cycle ago. How has your broad thesis on Bitcoin and crypto changed since then, if in any way? I think the core thesis of Bitcoin as the superior store of value has not changed at all. Um, I think, if anything, we've seen that thesis play out and it's accelerated now that we have the ETFs and many you know, large Wall Street firms all participating. Uh, with that said, um, I do think that uh, one thing I've changed my mind on is uh, I used to have very deep conviction that Bitcoin was going to be uh, this great medium of exchange. It could replace a bunch of currencies, et cetera. Uh, now, maybe that happens. Maybe it doesn't. I have less conviction uh, that it is going to happen or needs to happen. Uh, instead, based on what I'm seeing in the market and based on the data uh, that we're getting, uh, it appears that people have chosen Bitcoin as that store of value. They kind of treat it as their savings account. And then they are using stable coins as their checking account or their ability to spend. And so instead of having a currency competition, what you're actually getting is two currencies rising together. You're getting Bitcoin rising as that store of value, and you're getting US dollar stable coins rising as that medium of exchange. Uh, and I think that's great for the dollar. And I think that's great for Bitcoin. I wanted just you to expand a little bit on this thesis uh, regarding Bitcoin as uh, playing the role of a saving account. Yeah, if you think in the traditional world, that's the three accounts you have, right? You have a savings account, you have a checking account, you have an investment account. What you do is you get paid into that checking account. You move some of your money over to your savings account. You don't touch your savings account. Rule number one of savings account, don't touch it. Your checking account is for living expenses and for spending. And then your investment account is for getting out of your currency and getting into investable assets that will appreciate through time and inflation. And so I think that Bitcoin is really taking on the role of the new savings account. It is the thing that people are saying, I'm going to convert my native currency into this Bitcoin thing. I'm going to leave it in that account. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to spend it. I'm not going to sell it. That's my savings. On top of that, I'm going to keep a 
checking account, whether electronic account or digital, and that's the money I'm going to spend. And then I've got an investment account. I'm going to hold other assets, whether they're stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, whatever else, I'm going to have an investment account. And so Bitcoin doesn't need to replace everything. Bitcoin, if it replaces just the savings account, it's going to end up being worth much, much more than it is today. But that framework of having a checking account, a savings account, and an investment account now allows you to overlay the crypto assets into that traditional system. And rather than put your money into a depreciating currency like the US dollar and only earning, let's say, half of 1% interest annually in your savings account, you now can go and put it into a hard currency like Bitcoin and allow it to continue to gain purchasing power and do the role of your savings account without having to worry about currency debasement. So now, Anthony, I would like to talk about your latest book that you released not long ago. It's called How to Live an Extraordinary Life. And it's essentially a collection of letters that you wrote for your children about uh, um, several uh, topics, not just finance, but also relationships, life in general. I just want to ask you if there is one specific lesson that you think it's particularly important for our audience to know. So a good example is something as simple as luck is not real. So many people assign luck as the reason why they were successful. They assign luck to whether they had a good day or a bad day. But luck literally does not exist. It is something that we created in our minds, uh, but it is not real. And what I mean by that is if Giovanni and I are both walking across the street, we get hit by a bus and we both lose our leg. Somebody goes to Giovanni in the hospital bed and they say, hey, what happened? You say, I was so unlucky. I was walking across the street and the bus hit me. And then they walk over to my hospital bed and they say, what happened? And I say, I was so lucky that they hit me the way they hit me because I'm still alive. Same situation, same outcome, two different perspectives. And so luck is something that is in your brain. You control it. And if you can just remember that luck is not real, then it gives you agency. And if you have agency, it then says to you, everything you want in life is sitting right in front of you. You can either be paralyzed by fear or you can go and you can get it. And the through line of this entire book just comes down to you have agency. The world is not as bad as you think it is. And you get the right to act upon the world rather than sitting back and letting the world act upon you. And the people who are successful, the people who are happy, the people who live their own version of an extraordinary life, those are the people who exhibit that agency on a day-to-day -day basis. Cool. Thanks a lot, uh, Anthony, for these very positive uh, uh, lessons. Thanks again for coming on our show. It's, it's been a pleasure. I hope that uh, next time we're going to talk uh, soon, uh, sooner than in four years. Thank you so much for having me. We'll definitely do it again before four years.